Welcome. How's everybody doing tonight? Southern California is full of untold stories, but even more that go unheard. Authentic first-person experiences of life in Southern California. Real people amplified. Each show is unique because of who's involved and where we are. Some of our folks are experienced storytellers. Many are not. And for some, this is their first time on stage or speaking in public. And tonight's show is reflective of the range of voices, experiences, and perspectives of those involved. Together, we explore our region one story at a time. A special thank you to the California Wellness Foundation for their generous support of this project. No show would be complete without a host. Please join me in welcoming your unheard LA host, Bruce Lemon. Welcome to Unheard LA, A Deeper Listen. I'm your host, Bruce Lemon, broadcasting from my home, gym, studio, office, slash everything else our homes have become. We hope you found a safe way to connect with loved ones and guide in a few good arguments over the holidays. We're still in a pandemic and a post-election haze, but there's work to do and stories to hear. So we're here to reconnect with some of our Unheard LA alumni. One of these days when we're in a theater sitting shoulder to shoulder again at a live Unheard LA, I'll ask you to uh, shout out where you're from and the space will fill up with voices and lives and stories. But for now, I'd just like to let you know that our team and our storytellers are all coming together from online from all over SoCal, like from San Dimas, Watts, Pasadena, West Athens, Altadena, Koreatown, Ventura, South Pasadena, and more. We are where you are. Now this past year hasn't turned out how many or any of us planned. There's been so much loss hardships still to come and more sweeping changes to how we live so we can live a moment to confront ourselves and examine how we became who we are how we formed our own views and decide how we want to move forward so that's why we're here to revisit some of the stories shared on the unheard la stage that reflect on the ways in which race racism and identity have shaped lives and experiences in southern california a deeper listen that I hope can lead to deeper understanding, compassion, and change. So each story will be followed by a conversation with four amazing people. So first up, I'd like to introduce Dana Amahir. She is an award-winning designer, developer, and data editor for KPCC and LAist, and co-editor for Race in LA and Racism 101. What's up, Dana? Hey, Bruce. What's good? It's good to see you. Good to see you. Now, in the next hour, we'll share the stories of three Unheard LA storytellers, but I'm excited to introduce you to them now. Joe Limer, Kara Lopez-Lee, and Alex Alfaro. How y'all doing? Good, good, good. Yeah, it's so good to see y'all again. So good to see y'all again. Uh, Hey, Dana, how about you tell us a little bit about Race in LA and Racism 101? Great. So, uh, Race in LA, we launched uh, last year in June. Uh, It's an essay series that uh, we ask Angelinos to reflect on how race and identity shape their everyday lives. We now have several sub-projects in the Race in LA ecosystem, including Racism 101, which came out of our uh, July uh, Deeper Listen conversations as a community engagement project. Our audience uh, was asking us how they could facilitate their own thought-provoking discussions Um, And we created a starter kit with tough questions to kind of help them get the ball rolling um, and several anti-racism resource guides to help inform and educate. Thanks, Dana. Uh, And that gets us to our first story. As we recall what it was like to move through the world and pick up new friends, new habits and new experiences, remember that we also left behind pieces of ourselves, like breadcrumbs. Here to share his trail, Joe Limer. The average person moves about 11 times in their life, usually settling down about 18 miles from their childhood home. See, the average person can connect to their past in a 15-minute drive, can easily visit spots where the spirits of first meaningful everythings reside, but I don't have that luxury. I first met my sister in Lorton, Virginia. My parents split up in Las Vegas, Nevada. First girlfriend, Makakilo, Hawaii. First kiss, Cumberland, Maryland. My first fight was in Clarksburg, West Virginia. This was all in a two-year span. I've moved at least 20 times in my life and my body still suffers from the whiplash of changed scenery, 
the jet lag of always called new kid, the motion sickness of school lunches with imaginary friends. I read somewhere in the US, one out of 150 travelers have baggage left behind each year, which means my odds of lost luggage increase exponentially with each move, so it's no surprise my childhood got checked on the wrong flight where running away and moving away are the same. Both actions never involve goodbye, so there was no point in learning hello, preferring to be that kid in the classroom photo that no one remembers, the boy who looked like empty space and smelled like unopened plastic. Sometimes I blame my family. I feel like my past was murdered and they all took turns holding the weapon. My mother answered questions about my history with an Asian silence that tasted like a last meal before execution. Mom, where is our family from? Where did you grow up? Why are we moving around so much? I hated asking questions because it felt like a guilty verdict like I was deporting my mother back to a place with no escape. So when you ask me where I'm from, when you ask me where I grew up, the question becomes a blunt object. A reply spills from my mouth like the first words after a concussion, but how do I say I can pack up my entire life in an hour if I need to? How do I say I am just as comfortable in a U-Haul than I am in my own room? How do I say my bed is a clutter of hotel towels and, and I sleep just fine? You know, I read somewhere that people deal with amnesia by telling themselves a story to fill in the blanks. So I tell myself we move around so much because staying in the same place for too long starts to get monotonous. I tell myself that change in scenery is good for the soul. I tell myself I don't need to know my past to get ahead. Don't need to dwell on traumas that will anchor me down. I tell myself that I can't be lost because I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. I tell myself a house is just a stack of wood with a number etched into its ribs. A house is a kiosk of pipes and stucco closed for business but a home. A home is wherever I feel comfortable taking off my shoes. A home is where I can remove my jacket and feel the weight of the world go with it. A home is where I can laugh so loud the sound of joy hits the wall and knocks me clean off my feet. It took me 40 years to figure out that I'm not looking for a place. The other day, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and I smiled. In that moment, I realized I've been home this entire time. That was Joe Lammer sharing his piece from our Unheard LA show at the James R. Armstrong Theater in Torrance. The piece is entitled Luggage. Joe joins us now with two other Unheard LA storytellers, Kara Lopez Lee and Alex Alfaro, as well as Racing LA co editor Dana Amahir. Dana? Joe, I gotta say that, that piece was just a gut punch. Um, I have to ask you know, a, a sense of stability, a, a physical home or, or not, you know, is such a big part of what makes us feel secure uh, as people. How did moving so many times growing up shape your sense of identity and just, you know, self-worth? Thanks for the question. I, uh, I, I think the, the best way that, that I learn um, in moving around is, is uh, to look at moving as a, a form of opportunity. Um, and it's an opportunity to create a new story. So it allowed me to go into myself and ask myself like, so, so who do I want to be or how do I want to project myself in front of new people, right? Um, I didn't have a, a past that people could point to and say, that's who you are. So essentially there was more power in myself, right? Um, and it, it made me deal with a lot of the uncomfortable realities of community um, from sort of a, a, a brand new perspective. And, and, and what I mean by that is uh, it, it allowed me to change the narrative, to go into myself to change a narrative and to answer the question myself. Um, in, in the poem, I talk about, uh, I talk about my, my mother, uh, my, Filipino, uh, my, my Filipino mother trying to answer questions and she, she couldn't answer those questions almost as if she was trying to run from a past, right? And, and so, so this, uh, this weird immigrant's past is we must forget and look forward, always looking forward. So, so I was taught to look at moving around not as like um, something that anchors me, but something to like look forward and shape what I want to be. 
that's a really interesting way to look at it. I mean, we're almost culturally taught as a society that, you know, you have to be anchored to one place. And, you know, if you're you constantly on the move, you're you're homeless. You're you're you don't have that sense of security. You don't have that, you know, home base. But to think of that as a sense of personal empowerment and a sense of each time is kind of a rebirth and an opportunity to grow and to create your own story. That that's really powerful. Yeah, thank you. And, and, but it but it also hurts too when when you know you 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 throw into yourself as much of a conviction in in shaping who you are uh, in moving into these different communities. So so for me, um, being part of a, a military family, I was moving around a lot, right? And some of the places that I moved to were. Uh, places that didn't know didn't know how to take people that look like me and that that became much more personal on 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 a weird level because it it wasn't like it, it wasn't like oh there were people that look like me that I could run to and who could tell me about history and tell me about community I was essentially alone so so when I talk about my first fight um in in West Virginia I mean, it was, it was because the first, it, it was my first racial experience and it made me, it, it hurt so much because no matter how hard I could imagine, you know, I am this type of person, this community took on, well, you can't, you will never be this part of this community because of who you are. And no matter how much you believe in yourself, you can't change that. And then I also had this contrast, which I'll, I'll, I'll you know, maybe talk about later on in the conversation, um, moving from West Virginia to Hawaii and racism from a different sense. So, so for example, racism in, in West Virginia was, we're not racist against you because you're Filipino. You are just not white, right? So it's, it's not like, like we recognize Filipino as, as different culture. We represent just anything that is non-white as a threat. And then to go to Hawaii, where I came into Hawaii with a Southern accent, and they're like, oh, you're Ooh. howling. And that's straight up like, wait, what? You're not one of us because of how you talk. You look like one of us. Right. You, you got the wow. same color as us, but on the inside, you're not. And so moving around so much, you have to navigate through those types of obstacles. Wow. That's amazing. You know, everywhere you go, you pick up you pick up some of that place and it becomes a part of you. Uh, and then you carry that every everywhere you go. Wow. I I, I never uh, saw it like that. I think I probably should have. I went to school in Virginia as well. Well, not West Virginia, but Virginia and um, the othering in in i think both of the virginias is 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 quite 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 jarring you know um quite quite jarring i went to school on a on a campus of hp on the campus of hbcu hampton university but right outside campus was like kkk symbols like written in red on the end of the bridge you know i went there with my experience of of race and how it works and how you navigate through it from being from la you know and then i go to virginia and it's like oh we got to look out for the clan <laughs> now. Uh, there's a different kind of danger here. I feel like my hood sense that came from LA where I protect myself and like keep myself out of, out of harm's way was even increased by living in that other part of the country for a while and taking in like the fears and traumas that come just from being around there. And then when I got to grad school, I sounded like I was from the South <laughs> and we spent the entire time trying to change my speech um, because I brought that with me. Wow. Yeah, Bruce, there, so, there, there are still some places, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. You just can't go past dark. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm still, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sundown, Sundown towns. towns. Yeah, Sundown exactly. towns. Like, they yeah. still exist. <laughs> they still exist. So I want to bring um, Alex and Kara a little bit into the conversation, and um, but touch on a little bit of what uh, Joe's piece was about. I have this sort of, uh, I've been asked this as sort of like a, you know, um, I don't know, one of those like coffee a table conversation kind of you know dinner party questions but it's kind of like if you had to stuff everything that makes up who you are um like you had to pack it all up in a suitcase like what would be the biggest part of that identity that you stuffed in like 
what piece of who you are is the biggest? Um, I would say quickly, um, my external hard drive that has all of my daughter's baby pictures and all the pictures that we grew up with. Um, because like Joe's piece, I, I, it resonates with me. Having been a former undocumented person who lived the life of poverty for 30 plus years, I moved around 32 times by the time that I that I put in paperwork to adjust my status in the country. So I know what that's like. And then, you know, having the opportunity to go back to the country that I was born in Guatemala a few years ago and, and um, not sounding like them. They're like, yeah, you look like us, but you're not from here, you know? Uh, so that means that we're going to sell you something for five times the amount. So, uh, yeah, it's a, I would just take, you know, I would just take my, my, my external hard drive. Yeah. Cause that's where my identity lies and the memories that I've created. Alex, that's really beautiful. I mean, that's, that's really awesome. Uh, Kara, what about you? Yeah, Dana, thank you. Um, you know, it's funny. I really related to Joe's story. I don't mention it in my story because it would get too confusing, but I actually moved around, um, quite a bit when I was, um, Growing up, so uh, from household to household, I was actually uh, bouncing back and forth between my grandparents and my dad, and he remarried several times. So I lived in El Sereno, I lived in Monterey Park, I lived in East LA, I lived mostly in Downey. Um, and I think the things that I carry internally are the ability to pick up and go anytime. Um, I've traveled around the country and around the world, and it's made it a lot easier since I since I moved around so much. Yeah, you know, I totally related to this feeling of like, um, who who am I if I'm not just the person who moves around? I actually write a lot about um, home and belonging and that it's a constant search, trying to figure out where it is that I fit in. And I think my ability to be chameleon-like and fit in anywhere. Um, also as a mixed race person, um, because I'm, I'm Asian, Latino, white. Uh, I even have some American Indian. Yeah, I just feel like, um, like I can, like I, I know how to go anywhere. What I would physically take with me uh, would be my writing and my photographs. Um, so, and I write a lot about all these subjects we're talking about. So that would go with me too. Wow. And again, it's really interesting that the physical things that we take with us represent the memories, and but the things that are kind of helping shape us. It's, it's the process. It's the, it's the journey. Um, I, I think with that, um, I'm going to kick it back to Bruce and we're going to, we're going to keep this moving. All right. All right. Uh, moving on to our second story. The 105 freeway is my freeway. It's about three minutes away and can get me to the beach in 15 minutes. But while that freeway can lead me to the waves, it made many of its own for the people of Downey. For more on that, here's Kara Lopez Lee. I used to travel the 105 on the way to my grandma's house, but that's not how I remember it. I always think of the 105 in the movie Speed, Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock <laughs> hurtling down the unfinished LA freeway in a public bus with a bomb on board. <laughs> For me, the 105 was its own kind of bomb, the one that blew up my childhood. For the first nine years of my life, from 1963 to 1972, I lived with my grandparents in a little pink house right here in Downey, back when this LA suburb was mostly what demographers call non-Hispanic white. My grandpa bought the house for $1 down, $1 to close, a deal for Army veterans. It sat on a Dory Street between two dead ends, one of those neighborhoods where everyone is friends and moms let kids run wild. So long as we follow the rule, you come home when the streetlights come on. My mom was my Mexican-Chinese grandma. Grandpa was a Korean from Hawaii, my dad's stepfather. My birth mother is white, but she wasn't in the picture. For those keeping score, I was a mixed race kid in a Latino Asian household in a white neighborhood. <laughs> the only other minorities on the block were this Japanese family down the street. But none of that meant much in our lower middle class neighborhood full of humble folks without delusions of grandeur. Everybody loved grandpa. 
He had this laid back Hawaiian charm, lived on island time, always laughing. He was a dedicated member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and a generous neighbor who lent everyone his tools. He built a loft bed in my room to give me a hideaway for reading and extra space below that for playing. Mom treated homemaking like chemical warfare, <laughs> battled invading germs armed with pine sol and Formula 409. Just remembering those fumes still gives me a headache. Still, her comfort food was a Mexican-American peace treaty, albondiga soup and corned beef and cabbage chocolatey champurado, and homemade apple pie. These were the smells of security. Those smells helped seal the bond with my best friend, Shelly, the girl next door. I'd stand outside her door and shout, can Shelly come out and play? Or we'd climb over our pink brick fence into each other's backyards. In the weeds between houses, we became jungle explorers. Shelly was a red-headed white girl with a bazillion freckles, and I turned brown without trying. <laughs> but we became friends before we knew the difference. One day, we played barefoot in my yard, hunting for snails to collect in my Tubsy doll's pink plastic bathtub. We were rescuing them from her big brother, Billy, who enjoyed pouring salt on snails to watch them shrivel and die. I still wonder if he grew up to be a scientist or a psycho. Shelly and I sat on the lawn to sort through our snail collection, and I noticed my feet were muddy. Now, elsewhere in LA, I had heard the phrase, dirty Mexican, and I developed a fear of being dirty. Embarrassed, I said, well, I think feet are weird. And Shelly said, well, I think my feet are beautiful, and they help me walk around. Then she sang, everything is beautiful, in its own way. That song was popular then, so I sang along. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We were only eight, but we understood what we were singing. The lyrics are not exactly subtle. <laughs> in years to come, that memory comforted me. In 1972, I turned nine, and the California Department of Transportation put our neighborhood on notice. We had to move to make way for the 105 freeway, Caltrans next solution to LA traffic congestion. Communities up and down the corridor protested the cruel steamroller of eminent domain. My grandparents bought a bigger house in a higher income neighborhood. Everything after that felt like our punishment for trying to move up in the world. I missed Shelly, but I still lived in Downey, so I felt optimistic about making new friends till I rode my bike through the neighborhood, only minority in sight. And a little girl hollered, get out of my neighborhood, you dirty Mexican. Used to the easy acceptance of a Dory Street, I duck walked over to her on my purple Schwinn with the banana seat to explain why it's wrong to call people that. <laughs> Surely when she saw how friendly I was, she'd apologize. Instead, she stomped away. By suggesting her parents were wrong, I only made her hate me more. I spent two lonely years till I started East Middle School and met my new best friend. Let's call her Kathy. She was the new white girl on the block and didn't know anybody. Because Kathy became my only friend, I laughed along when she called me Beaner. She called other Mexican kids worse names, so one day I asked, you know, if you hate Mexicans, why do you hang around me? Well, you aren't like other Mexicans, she said. I was the only Mexican she knew. Still, Kathy shared her family and her home with me when I really needed them. You see, my grandparents divorced when I was 12, and my grandma became the only single working mom for blocks. Kathy's parents must have known she needed a break, and so did I. They invited me to sleepovers every weekend. Kathy and I stole cookies from her mom's cookie jar. We watched scary movies all night and traced stories on each other's backs with our hands. But our friendship had limits, and nothing could save mom and me from moving down in the world. We were broke, our yard became an eyesore, and neighbors complained. I began to internalize their fears to resent my own family. 
and couldn't help asking the terrible question, am I a dirty Mexican? Despite that, at Downey High, I found new friends who accepted me as me, not as an exception to the rule. Kathy and I grew apart. As for Shelley, once we left Adore Street, I never saw her again. As a teenager, sometimes I drove back to Adore to stare at our boarded up house. It took years to evict everyone. I envied the families who stayed, even though the neighborhood looked condemned. I was in college when Caltrans bulldozed our house. One night I got out of my VW bug to stand in the dirt where my room used to be, where Grandpa built me wood toy boxes with wheels and Shelly and I sat inside them and rolled around the wood floors playing bumper cars. <laughs> now, I felt as empty as that dirt lot. Sometimes I wonder what might have happened if not for the 105. Cradled by tight-knit neighbors, might my grandparents' marriage have survived? Might Shelley and I still be friends? Might my youth have remained filled with the unreserved acceptance of a Dory Street? I was 30 when Caltrans finished the 105 freeway in 1993. Today, the 105 has completely eliminated LA traffic congestion. <laughs> Who knows, maybe it helped. For me, though, it felt like the government tore down my happy childhood, back when my grandparents' little pink house was the safest place I knew. That was Kara Lopez Lee with her piece from our Unheard LA show at the Downey Theater in Downey. The piece is titled Shelley and the 105. Kara joins us now with two other Unheard LA storytellers, Joe Limer and Alex Alfaro, as well as Race in LA co editor Dana Amahir. Dana? Kara, that piece just really, really made me think. Can you describe the evolution of your um, relationships? Your best friend, Shelley, your kind of racist, but was a friend not to be alone, Kathy, and um, the acceptance you experienced at Downey High. How did these friendships, along with the perceptions of your neighbors um, by the 105, and then later um, when you moved um, into a different house in Downey, affect your sense of identity growing up um, and your self-worth? I mostly lived in Downey with my grandparents, but I also lived um, off and on with my father, uh, when he would remarry, he remarried several times. So that house, uh, in Downey became a central pivot point, uh, for my life. So it became very central for me, but I actually lived, uh, with my dad for a while in Monterey park and he was married to, a, a Latino woman. And then I moved back in with my grandparents in Downey at Adore street. And then back with my dad, when he married, remarried to a white woman, uh, and then they divorced and I was back with my grandparents and in between, uh, I lived in El Sereno, East LA. I feel like, I mean, in terms of the friendships you're talking about, it was very hard for me to maintain them in general. So those actually were the anchoring friendships that I, that I had. And at the time when I was living in Monterey Park, for example, that was when I think I first became aware that I was different from other people. And it was interesting because in Monterey Park at that time, it was primarily, it was, it was pretty uh, split between the kids in my school were white, Asian, and Hispanic, primarily Mexican. But they were all either white or Asian or Hispanic. And so everybody got along great, but I was outsided. Like, I was the outsider. I was othered because I didn't look like something that they could figure out. And the, one of the first questions I got asked that made me realize that there was something that there was a reason I was getting bullied because I got bullied quite a bit. I, I actually didn't go to the bathroom uh, in the at the school for two years because there were bullies that would wait in the bathroom to beat kids like me up. So I um, so I, I had to pee really bad when I got home every day. Anyway, my, my point is, is that I kept getting asked, what are you? The question was, what are you? Uh, over and over. And I would very proudly at first answer, you know, I would say, you know, I'm, you know, English, French, Germans, uh, Swedish, Cherokee, 
Mexican, Chinese, you know, all these different things. And uh, people looked at me like, weirdo, we don't actually want to know, you know, <laughs> we just think, what are you? Like, they didn't actually, weren't that interested in the answer. That's not always true, by the way. Sometimes I get asked, what are you? And they're just, people are just curious. You know, they really are curious, like, what, what came to the making of you? So friendship was always really hard. Um, I think I learned, so I learned that people see what they want to see. And I think I learned to be a chameleon. Like when I was around my Mexican cousins and my Mexican neighbors, like in El Sereno or East LA, I sounded Mexican. I dressed, you know, like the other kids. I looked more like them. I tried to blend in. It still didn't always work. I still got othered as like, you're not really Mexican. And then I, if I was in a white neighborhood, I would act really white and I would wear the things that they were wearing and I would talk slightly differently. Um, and so I've, I've actually learned to sort of have the, it, it, I mean, it's terrible, right? I mean, I'm sort of sub, being subsumed by whatever's going on around me, but it's a skill that's that's um, stayed with me. And now I just try to think of it as I hold all these things inside of me rather than try to pick out the pieces that suit somebody. What are some of the, the, the things that we do um, to kind of be that chameleon, to kind of you know, assimilate into different situations. Um, I'd love to hear from you, you know, Joe, Alex, you know, some of the things that we, you kind of have to do to, in some cases, just survive a situation or survive a, being in a certain community or certain situations to just, um, you know, um, not in, I mean, in Kara's case, the extreme to not get beat up or bullied or, you know, or in some case, or I guess in a lesser way to just not feel alone or not to feel othered. For me, um, and, and it's, it's a tough decision that, that I've had to make a few times because I, I feel, sometimes I, I feel like it's, it's, it's traitorous, but like um, the idea that you have to play to the stereotype in order to survive. One of the things that's been hard for me is, is sort of um, acknowledging and understanding the, the idea of Asian as model minority. And there are moments where I don't feel proud of myself but I've had to act a certain way and to do certain things that are part of that model minority stereotype in order to get to the next point. One of the biggest um, experiences that I've had, like huge experiences I've had with racism in, in West Virginia, and it was, a, it was a racist incident involving not me, but I was with my mom and it involved people saying things towards my mother and mm. me being you know, in junior high, my first instinct is to just, I'm going to, I'm going to hurt whoever hurts my mother. Um, you know, and then that's when my mother, you know, took me aside and she essentially said, you know, you're, you're going to have to take this now, you know, cause you can't solve this with violence. Um, but one day, right. I mean, I, I want you, if you want to deal with this, right. Um, to learn to use words or to learn to use your mind in terms of stopping this. And, th and that's what prompted me, actually, that was one of the big moments for me into um, continuing my studies. I ended up going to law school. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I now teach and, and everything um, like that. But, uh, but it was the idea of, you know, this, this stereotype of um, within the Asian community that when we see wrongs, we actually don't report it. I actually did a, did a study where, like when it came to hate crimes, Asians are, are very um, reluctant to report these things because of a shame it may bring upon them individually. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not something I'm proud of um, to stay silent, um, but, but to look at it as in this opportunity, you need to get out of it and then move on. So Kara and Joe, you've kind of both touched on it um, kind of these moments and experience where you've kind of it, it's been you've understood what it means to be the race that you are and it's sort of like these experiences that have concretized like i'm kind of other i'm kind of you know not accepted for whatever reasons alex do you want to you want to chime in on that i mean for me it's always been uh speak at the good english 
you know, uh, uh, being, you know, what kind of Mexican are you? Well, I'm from Guatemala. Well, what part of Mexico is that from? Um, you know, looking like this and, and, and playing the game of assimilation, which was vital to my survival when I was a child, uh, coming from, you know, first generation immigrant parents who instilled in me um, not just the necessity, but uh, but the urgency of being American and what it meant to be American and what it meant to uh, being culturally uh, adept and being able to adopt to all of it uh, while simultaneously teaching them how to also be a part of the American fabric. And so um, that's part of the reason why I became a writer. That's part of the reason why I became a poet, because I, one of my earliest experiences was being in kindergarten and uh, the kids making fun of me because I didn't know how to speak English. And um, them, them calling me dummy and pouring milk over my head um, and, and me going home and telling my mom in Spanish, I don't want to go back to school because I don't understand them. And within the course of one semester, I, I, I taught myself English. I remember watching Sesame Street with my mom and I remember watching Mr. Rogers Neighborhoods and reading Rainbow. And I just, I absorbed all of it in an effort to become part of the fabric and at the, at, at the expense and the cost of my own cultural identity for a long time, because I didn't know what it meant to be a Latino, to be Latinx, to be part of a vibrant and beautiful community um, that was culturally deprived and 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 a past that was stolen from us. Because even to this day, as a descendant of the Mayan people, I don't know my history as a Mayan. I know American history very well. I can tell you about politics very well, but I don't know very much about Guatemala, except that it is the land of big, beautiful trees. Yeah, code switching for for survival, and it, it's it's more than just about language. It's 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 about you know the way you carry yourself and the way you present yourself. I I, I spent a lot of of my life trying to uh, be as non threatening as possible, just for my for my protection. At the same time, relying on like being of a certain height with some broad shoulders and a black guy to like protect me from like other elements. Everything except the law, for the most part. Yeah, Dana, if I could add, you know, um, I yeah. I hear things that I'm not supposed to hear because if you look at me, you can see I, you know, I, I pass, you know, I, I can look just white uh, if you want to see that. And sometimes I hear racist stuff that I think most Mexican people and most Asian people don't get to hear firsthand because people assume what I am and they say things to me and... I was not that surprised when things exploded this year because I have been hearing all these things all my life. Uh, sometimes I tell somebody I'm, you know, they say something racist and I'll say, oh, you know, I'm Mexican, right? And man, they start backpedaling so mm -hmm. fast. Oh, that's okay. I love Mexican people. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's fascinating what I get to hear. It's like I'm a fly on the wall when I'm in the conversation. Oh, Kara, I totally feel you on that. Most people look at me. I've lived in several places that have heavy uh, Latino and Spanish speaking populations. Well, I took Spanish for, I don't know, like a decade and minored in it in college and was fluent for um, a pretty good while. But now I can just kind of read it and write it and I can understand it, but not really speak back. In these heavily sp um, Spanish speaking areas, I would go into and there's I'm the only person that kind of looks like me and I'm, you know, married to a white guy and we kind of stick out together. And it's sort of like the you can kind of tell they're like, OK, I don't know what this is all about, but I can understand what they're saying and they don't expect me to understand what they're saying. And I can turn around and like reply back or at least like be like, really, that's what that's what you're thinking. And it's sort of like, oh, no, 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 that's not what we meant. And I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, yeah. So I to an extent, I can relate to how you feel like you're in on conversations that weren't really meant for your ears. And it's it's just it's like it's amazing what people will say when they think no one is listening. Well, we can all take language lessons on our phones now. So if you're listening, it's, it's <laughs> you, you you cut that out we can everybody knows what you're saying <laughs> we that, can tell Google, you. that google translate that got yeah. that google translate yeah. up and it's like yeah i i heard that <laughs> i think we should uh kick it to our, our last piece bruce our city is a living breathing organism 
shifting on tectonic plates, sliding histories into chasms of casual disregard. Our third storyteller knows what a changing neighborhood looks like, but he's never forgotten his way home. Please welcome Alex Alfaro. I grew up all over LA. So by the time that I was 29, I had averaged one new address per year. But there's one address that I always went back to, the house on Edgeware Road. See, I grew up in Echo Park, before gentrification kicked my childhood friends and their families out, before the massive buyouts of families that had been there for at least a generation. This was back in the day when Diamond Street Gang and the Headhunters Boys would have shootouts in front of the Echo Park indoor pool. When I used to go fishing at the Echo Park Lake with my friends, but made sure to be home by the time that the lights came on, because rumor had it, that lake is where they used to dump the bodies of the enemy. This was before I was looked at funny walking down my own neighborhood, before people I had never seen before turned Sunset and Echo Park into a trendy street where people like me were no longer seen as part of the community, but rather a nuisance reminder of what it used to be. This piece is about me and the house I grew up in, the house on Edgeware Road. Growing up on the edge of nowhere is where I discovered who I was going to be, Lil Chino. I was christened since the age of three. I never truly understood why I was told to flee the hood as soon as I would be a grown-up, or at least pass for one. I was told, run away or you'll fulfill his destiny, for this is who you'll become, like Big Cheeto, your dad, an abusive addict and bum. Her voice was bittersweet like victory. Her eyes were deep with pride and misery. Her sinful mysteries were amongst her tragedies, accentuating her humanity and mostly why it appealed to me to listen to Mercy's ministry. But what does she know about Chino, who took food out of his mouth in order for me to sleep through my stomach growls? Although tormented by regret and doubt, he carried a permanent smile as he went about. Did what she know prevent her from letting me inside her house? Allow me to play with her son too long or pity me with her spouse? A lost angel, I be, who is daily captivated by my city's lost beauty, unlike how mom became captive by the love that tolerated Pop's beatings daily. It had nothing to do with love. Lust was daddy's angel dust plus. He didn't wear a glove, and soon my fate was sold for a fee. Don't tell him nothing, mijo! He yells as he's hauled away to Rampart Station on Benton and Temple. Crash unit, LAPD. Always playing around of who done it with daddy. He's taken around the corner from where I first taught myself to ride a bike in frustration. Countless times, I almost got hit by cars at that mobile gas station. Don't worry, pops. The secret of your dope stash is safe with me. This and more is constantly asked of the boy who climbs the Nispero tree. That's where the hammock would be placed all summer, you see. That's where I'd eat low quats while observing the dope spot across the street, daydreaming of future adventures without any cares, in this place where innocence, like cash and rations, are scarce. Every day the depression grips hearts, ever fears. Weakness is a no-no, so go conquer your fears and play under the night's dark skies. Polluted by kids' laughter and grown-up despair. Got money for booze, but not enough to spare on clues that witnesses holler and cry. Sure, I'll buy into your games and grow up on your lies. It's cool and empty in this part of the dark. Maybe soon I could preach at the bench at MacArthur Park. The smog manifests as a result of sorrow suppressed. Daddy don't need Teflon. Give him a migra-proof vest. Fake IDs and socials to throw off INS, this was way before ICE came to replace. Missing persons reports were this reader's digest. My life wasn't fun, but I lived for the jest. Ill-managed and ran, but I still tried my best. I was raised Catholic, but I wouldn't confess. I saw back then firsthand the church mess. Yet still, I am blessed, no more middle fingers in the air. This memory I recite is the sight my soul finds when my eyes go off and I stare. I can still see myself eating ice cream on top of the stairs overlooking the broken sidewalk, where my Uncle Manny changes a flat to a spare, charges a six-pack as his usual fare. An ice-cold miller? Tell me what can compare. An ice-cold killer 
snuffed them out. It ain't fair. He was beat to death till his liver ruptured. The guilty party was never captured. He died in silence. He didn't cry. Heavy crime. He died over a piece, two blunts, and a dime. His blood cakes up on the boiling concrete. He stares at me blankly. Oh, was it just a damn heap? While auntie puts clothes to dry on the line, she heard the ruckus, but she lives in the lie, unaware that her brother lies still as he dies. Thirty-five years it took to exhaust his lifeline. Thirty-five paces away, he is saying goodbye, but she's too busy bragging about the washer this time. Thirty-five more payments, and it's all mine. Plenty more story, let me press rewind. 165 yards to the top of the hill. Pop's old Corolla struggles on its last wheel. On hot ass sunny days, you can smell the road kill dumped in the alley where I used to chill. Where as a child, we would have soapbox races. That's how Keith and Kicks got scars on their faces. That alley is where I taught baby G how to tie his shoelaces and where I used to get high during my teenage faces. Vista Hermosa Park has now replaced this. My childhood's not lost, it just lives in displacement. 165 north of all worry. I fight every day to not allow these memories to go blurry. Because I'm still here, homie. I've just been in demand. Using my love for the hood to fuel my plans. A lost angel I be that trailed away from my land. And I know, I know, for years I've strayed in Rome. But don't trip, fam. This here's my Rome. Build out of cardboard and styrofoam. My daughter's family still lives in that home. I still live there too, but inside my dome. Now I'm still that little kid just writing an ode about 165 North Edgeware Road. That was Alex Alfaro sharing his piece from our Unheard LA show at the Nate Holden Performing Arts Center in Mid City. The piece is titled 165 North Edgewire Road. Alex joins us now with two other Unheard LA storytellers, Kara Lopez Lee and Joe Lammer, along with Racing LA co editor Dana Amahir. Dana? Alex, I, I just felt like I was there listening to your piece. Um, in it, you said you, you grew up on the edge of nowhere, but at the same time, there's like this palpable passion and this love for this place. Uh, the hood, as you call it, um, that you called home. What does it mean to you to love a place that you said you were literally told to leave and get out as soon as possible? How do you find the beauty in living there? Uh, loving it as as a as an act of rebellion, as an act of defiance, uh, because you know, like I stated earlier, I've moved around a lot in my life throughout the whole city of Los Angeles. So sometimes I'm from K Town, sometimes I'm from South Central, sometimes I'm from Echo Park, sometimes I'm from East Los on on Whittier and and Record. You know, uh, it just <laughs> it, it I needed to have a place. Because as I was growing up, I knew that I didn't have a permanent place to call a home. I, sometimes I didn't even have an address, you know, like I would fill out an application for something and I'm like, uh, what address should I use? And the one address that I could always use when I was a kid uh, was was Edgeware Road uh, because my auntie still lived there. My auntie didn't move from there. Both my aunties didn't move from there until I was maybe like 20. Um, and funny enough, after my family moved out of the house on Edgeware Road, uh, um, the family that eventually became my daughter's grandparents and family, they moved into that house and, and they still live in that house. And so, you know, like last weekend, I dropped my daughter off to go, you know, to go visit her grandparents. And, you know, they still live in that house, which, you know, which trips me out. And I have this wild dream uh, that one day I'm going to buy that house. And, and, and I'm going to restore it to its original uh, um, form and, and I'm just going to live in it. Like I said, I needed something to connect me to the only home that I had ever known. And ever since I was very young, I always knew that technically I didn't belong here. Technically, I didn't have permission to be here. And at any given time, I could be sent away. I could be taken, taken from the only place that I, that, that, that I would feel comfortable, like Joe said, to take my shoes off, to take my load off, right? Um, so, you know, having a place to be able to go back to 
regardless of how old I got, regardless of what I was going through, regardless of, you know, how far I had strayed away. I mean, I lived in Orange County in Anaheim for 10 years and I would always come back to Edgeware Road to go visit my family. And so, yeah, it's part of the makeup of my identity, right, as an Angelino to be able to go back to these places, um, to be able to visit Echo Park and see how it's changed. It's heartbreaking to go back to Lamert Park in South Central L.A. and see how it's changing. It's heartbreaking uh, to see that certain places in, in East L.A., um, you know, near near Whittier Boulevard and and. and um, and see how it's all very, very different. And so that park, Vista Mosa Park, uh, that's that's right there where Edgeware Road is at, it, it used to be a landfill. I mean, it was land, just nothing but dirt for decades, you know, as I was growing up. Um, and now it's this beautiful park, and it sucks because sometimes I go there and I feel like a stranger. I feel like a visitor. But all I have to do is just literally close my eyes. And when I close my eyes, I remember and I feel it. It's in the earth, you know. I feel the memories. I, I hear the laughter. I, you know, the the water balloon fights and the and and the hide and seeks and you know, growing up in this community where there's like 25 little kids, dude. It's like nothing but children playing all day, every day. And, and much like what Kara said, it's like as long as you're home, by the time that the lights come on, the belts will not come off, right? Yes. Alex, I think it, it's so interesting. Okay, I just want to pull out a couple of things here because there's so much in what you just said. So first, just the idea that um, your the contrast between your piece and Joe's piece, like this idea that you have this anchor, this sort of like generational place, like this physical space that you you see as home but at the same time the place has changed so much around it that you i mean you've gone all over the place in in, in terms of like having you know different addresses and zip codes in la like you've been from all over but you feel like this place is what ties you this was what you're connected to to the point that this is sort of your this is your bond this is your bond and this is your place but at the same time it's so different that you have to I mean, you just kind of close your eyes and that takes you back. But then in Joe's case, it's sort of like he's moved around so many times. It's like it's all it's all here. It's all here. It's that emotional state of mind of home. And I, I just want to unpack a little bit when the physical home is just like gone. Like, I mean, gentrification is a big part of L.A., um, I'm not a native Angelino, but I know that's a, a big part of why some people don't have that physical like childhood home anymore. Like here, yours was um, uh, was uh, taken because of you know the expansion of the highway system. But it's sort of like when you don't have that place anymore, how do you reckon with that when that is gone? Like that um, piece of your childhood of that that piece of who you were is gone. Like, how do you deal with that? Is, is like closing your eyes and the memories, is that enough? I mean, I, I, at least for me real quickly is, is I'm very fortunate that I still do have a, a, a small group of friends that I grew up with, you know, in these various communities. Like I, you know, I go to Echo Park and I visit my auntie or I go drop off my daughter and I'll run into some fools that I've known since I was a little kid. You know, I'll run into some guys that I went to elementary school with, that I went to middle school with. I live like, like a 10 minute walk from my middle school, you know? So like what Joe was saying, yeah, 18 miles, right? You, people tend to live in the neighborhoods where they grew up. So I'm very fortunate that I still have some people that I have uh, a connection to. Mm, thank you for that, Alex. I, I think you're right in that Alex and I are going after the same thing, right? In terms of like how we see home, we approach it differently, right? And and whereas he has a physical place, for me, it's, it's sort of the idea that... Um, to be from nowhere means, also means you can be from everywhere, right? And so, so it's, about, it's about catching the memories or the feelings that you have and, and making that as real as you can. So, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm in San Diego, but, but I go up to LA, I, I, I go up to Filipino town and there's, there's a meal that I get, or I go to Long Beach, uh, when I'm craving some like really good Hawaiian food, when I'm craving like some taco poke, right? I go straight there and 
it takes me to Hawaii. It doesn't, I, I don't have to, like, like just a taste for me, like brings me back to that, to that memory where like I felt that type of security, right? And so, and so I, think, I, I think one of the amazing things, and I'm so thankful um, for being part of this, um, is, that, is that I found a place right, in Southern California, right, more, even more specifically like LA that caters to so much diversity and so many differing ideas of what people can call home. So it makes LA, it makes this area like very open to, to calling it home. So even if you're a visitor, like I can, I, can, I, can, I can hit certain neighborhoods in LA and be like, man, this is, this, this is what home feels like to me, right? And so, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't have the physical locations that Alex has, but I, I'm definitely accessible to the memories and the feelings that it can contain. What I was going to ask is, Joe, you touched on something that I was actually going to ask in the next question and that, Kara, you touched on in your piece a little bit. And it's how food ties into our identities and like how it can take you back to these little pieces of home, even if you don't have that physical space is like the taste of like just getting back um you that first bite and it can just take you there so like what's the one dish like what's the maybe the one dish or the one meal that just takes you right back to that feeling of of home uh, and i know you mentioned yours joe what's yours kara cocido it's um it's um beef bone soup it's like this it's a, it's just vegetables and beef bones and um, it's just soup, but my grandma, it, it has cumin in it and the smell and the taste, and it's extremely simple. It, it doesn't make sense to my husband. Sometimes we'll go out to a Mexican restaurant and they have really excellent, amazing dishes. And cocido is like the most basic. It's like ordering mac and cheese, like, of, of, of it's like the mac and cheese of Mexican food, you know, I, but I just, it, it just makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> Mac and cheese is all is always good. So yeah, if, it, yeah, if it fits yeah. in that category, it's always Don't good. Don't knock it, right? Right? Yeah. Kara, it's like mac and cheese or like the chicken tenders on the kids menu. It's like it's not. It's, it's not, you know you, you go back to what you know, what you love. Joe was mentioning something though that I wanted to touch on. All these stories we're listening to and discussing, and all the topics we're discussing remind me that you know the thing about Los Angeles is it feels like it really is in and of itself. Um, about dislocation and change and uh, motion and also um, people uh, mixing uh, and all these different mixtures of people. As time has gone on, I've learned to, to see myself as sort of the repository of all this mixing. Like I am the quintessential Angelino because I'm mixed, because I've been in many places. And so I feel like I hold it inside me and living in all the different places I've lived in. I've lived in Alaska, New Mexico, North Carolina, Denver. Um, I've traveled around the world and everywhere that I go, when I come back, I'm like, oh, now that I've seen all these other places, there is something very Los Angeles about me. Not sure I can describe it for you, but I think this, this sense of, um, being able to embrace so many differences is really part of it. And I, I didn't get to, you know, I forgot to touch on earlier, you asked me about um, the high school friends that I later had. And I still am good friends with a couple of people from my high school, from Downey High. And just being friends with those people, that is part of an anchor. Like we've known each other for more than 30 years, you know, um, actually almost 40 years now. Um, so, and, and they're still in the LA area, not precisely, but in LA, but yeah. So um, that kind of helps me feel like I'm still part of that, that, that long thread back. Oh, wow. Um, Alex, you want to um, uh, wrap us up with some last thoughts? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to share that, like, you know, we were talking about, culture and food and for me it's like it depends on where i'm at right it's exactly what joe is saying you know if you go down to filipino town you go to tribal cafe or you go to park's finest which is literally across the street from my elementary school so that school with the with with the mural with the kids holding hand that's my elementary school but for me any place that's home regardless of where i'm at is is uh, my aunt violet's cooking 
because my aunt Violet raised me. So, you know, anytime I feel like I've gone on a, on a long trip or when I was, you know, I was uh, touring my solo show a few years back and, and I was gone from LA for almost half a year. One of the first things I did when I came back home is I went straight to my tia's house and I'm like, tia, can you make me some food? And she's like, what do you want? Mijo, I said, anything, anything, as long as it's made by your hands. So yeah, that's my LA. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, yesterday, I was having, I was having a, I was having a moment. I was uh, just coming off of a lot of shows and really emotional. So I went to the the burger stand near my house that I've been going to for at least thirty years, and just got a pastrami sandwich and fries. Just, and I mean, it's got to be from a L.A. burger stand on the corner. It can't be too many of them. If it is a chain, it's a small family-owned chain. They got one location over here and one location down the street. Maybe you know, <laughs> and that's it. Like. That's as that's as fancy as I need to be, and it tastes like it tastes like the East Side. It tastes like home, you know. It tastes like Watts, you know. Uh, uh, anything anything other than that, I'm like, uh, it's good, but it doesn't. So I feel better having taken in that that bite of home afterwards, you know. You gotta you gotta find those touch points to to bring you there. That's beautiful, y'all. That's beautiful. That is that is our show. Uh, we could stay here and talk all the time, but now we've gotten into food. I don't know about you, but I'm all hungry. I hope if you're listening to this at home, you're going to get something to eat right now to, to trap that feeling or go get it. Um, thank you to all the folks at KPCC and LAist that make Unheard LA possible and to our extended Unheard LA family and that train that's passing by right now. A uh, special thank you to today's storytellers, Joe Limer, Kara Lopez-Lee, and Alex Alfaro, and to Dana Amahir for Race in LA and for being a part of this event and being a catalyst for important conversations like these. We are eternally grateful to the California Wellness Foundation for their generous and ongoing support of Unheard LA from the very beginning. Uh, KPCC and LAist members, thank you. You truly make everything we do possible, y'all. Everybody has a story, so what's yours? Share with us at kpcc.org slash unheard LA. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our Unheard LA newsletter. It's the best way to be the first to find out about what's next. Speaking of, we'll be right back in the next installment of our Deeper Listen series a week from today. Once again, thank you for joining us. And remember, whatever you do, don't leave your story unheard. Bless you.